there's five really critical questions you've got to ask yourself if you're going to have a really powerful personal brand. One is exactly who do you serve? Two, exactly how do you serve them? Three, what qualifies you to serve them? Four, how does it make their life better? And five, what makes you different from everyone else also trying to serve that same type of customer? Mm -hmm. So when you answer those, that's really where the personal brand begins, not ends. You found the Real Estate Law Podcast. Because real estate is more than just pretty pictures and law goes well beyond the paperwork and courtroom arguments. If you're a real estate professional or looking to build real estate expertise, then welcome to the conversation and discover more at realestatelawpodcast.com. Welcome to the Real Estate Law Podcast. Thanks again for listening or watching us. If you're in the car, if you're in front of your computer, Rory, we're both in front of our computer um, and we're going to be learning a lot today about personal branding because we honestly need a lot of help with that. I'm sure if you're listening, you need a lot of help with that as well. You might think that you know how to do it, but you know, branding is an evolving space. Marketing is always changing. There's new tech out there. There's new social out there and there's a lot of competition. Yeah. And special attention to any real estate agents that are listening, because this is really the core of your business. But for everybody else too, your personal brand, whether you're an employee, whether you're an investor, is really going to deter open doors for you if you're consistent, if you're smart about your personal branding. So with that, Jason, can you introduce our guests today? Yes, we have esteemed guests who are experts in the space. They're going to teach us all about marketing versus branding, the differences in those things, and how we could build our personal brands online. Please meet Tanya Eberhardt and Michael Carr from Brandface. Welcome, guys. Hey, thanks for having us, guys. We are so happy to be here. Yeah, thank you so much. So you are in Georgia. Did I get that right? Yes. We're all just right. north of Atlanta, maybe 40 minutes in the suburbs. Mm -hmm. yep. We're about 40 minutes north of Boston ourselves. So, you know, we're all living our suburban lives outside these big cities. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so now you are your, your authors. You started this company. You have a podcast. You are real estate uh, agents, coaches. You know, you've worked like the gambit. I mean, Michael, I was reading about you. Um, you've been involved in over 78,000 transactions. You're a real estate auctioneer. Yes. Is that true? Yes. Oh. Yeah. That's our published number. Uh, the truth of the matter is I was a senior vice president of the second largest auction company on earth during the debacle. And we were responsible for about 175,000 transactions. But I personally can put my name to uh, at that time, well over 70,000. And then we've grown from our personal brokerage, boutique brokerage here north of Atlanta out of the other numbers. So, yeah. Goodness. An actual auctioneer, like do you have the skill to like you know, I am. be on that podium? Are you really? Yeah, that's how I, st I started. My dad was a car dealer and we'd go to the auctions to buy cars. And I just, I didn't really like the car business as much. I love the atmosphere though. It was almost like a carnival. And so I just uh, decided that's what I wanted to be. And um, I gave up college and, and education to do it. So wow. yeah. <laughs> that's such a crazy skill. You don't meet too many people that are involved in the auctions. Tanya, how did you and Michael come together? Well, we actually got introduced by my aunt, who is one of Michael's real estate agents. And uh, she knew that I did some sort of marketing or branding. You know how you you wish your family would, could articulate exactly what you do, but nobody knows. <laughs> so, But she said, you know, Michael, your marketing's terrible. You need to talk to my niece. And so she pitted us against one another and said, he's expecting your call. She's expecting your call. And so finally, I called him one day and said, hey, uh, um, I don't know who's supposed to be calling whom here, but here I am. So let's talk. And he said, literally, guys, this this will set up the rest of the conversation today. He hangs his head because he knows what he did. He <laughs> said, I have already had five more just like you. I don't need another one. Mm, that's, that's, a great way to, that's a great way to endear yourself to somebody, isn't it? It is. It, it's rude. <laughs> you know, rude. He said it with, you know, with a little tongue in cheek, but still. You know, it's that was the response. And it, the important part to that is I was wrong. And I know yeah. we're reporting and there are witnesses. So I will, I have admitted it since that <laughs> very day. Uh, well, two weeks after that day. Uh, and I've been admitting it ever since. It takes a very strong man to admit when he's wrong. So you know, yes, it does. On record. And, and, and Rory, that, that degree of rudeness is something we'd expect from us in the Northeast, not from people with uh, <laughs> lovely Southern accents like our friends from Georgia. 
No, and I mean my concern here, just to kind of tie that back, is if that I mean if that's how you spoke to people at the time or encountered people, was that part of your personal brand in, oh, at the time? That's a good question. That's Great, a good question. Fantastic question. Yeah, actually, I've got to say, I'll, uh, as much as I hate to do it, I have to step in here and rescue him because. <laughs> That is not, he's the kindest, most, he has the biggest heart of anybody you'll ever meet, right? But he was, he was poking fun just a little bit, but it's, you know, if you're the other person on the other line, it's like, I don't know you, you're really telling me that like, you've had five more just like me. And literally I just blurted out, you haven't seen anybody like me. She did. Yeah. And, and that sets the tone for the rest of the story. So uh, it, it really wasn't what he was known for. In fact, when we first started talking about personal branding, I said to him, you know, there are certain things that we need to do here. And he said, no, wait a minute. I don't know if I want to do this personal branding thing and really put myself out there. I mean, what are people going to think? You know, what if they think I'm arrogant or egotistical? And that's where I had a chance to say to him, no, that's not what personal branding is all about. It's not about look at me, look at me. It's look what I can do for you. And when I explained that to him, you know, that showed the level of concern that he had for putting himself that, out there in a different way. But it also allowed me to show him that that's not what it's all about. It was really about stating how you can help people and who you can help. Mm -hmm. Is one of the keys there to figure out who you, yeah, who you want to help and like, you know, why you want to help them? I mean, that that's probably a question you should answer before you even go down this road, isn't it? That's huge. Absolutely. It's huge. It's huge. In fact, there's five really critical questions you've got to ask yourself if you're going to have a really powerful personal brand. One is exactly who do you serve? Two, exactly how do you serve them? Three, what qualifies you to serve them? Four, how does it make their life better? And five, what makes you different from everyone else also trying to serve that same type of customer? Mm -hmm. So when you answer those, that's really where the personal brand begins, not ends. Those are tough questions also. I mean, those are like sit down yes. and, and you don't knock them out in an hour. I mean, that could be an all-day workshop, if not longer, with help from people. No. Absolutely. I mean, mm -hmm. I'd even say that's kind of a lifelong evolution too, to constantly think of those questions there. You know, there are so many people out there. I know and the very first thing I ask real estate agents when I'm working with them to, I mean, I guess I don't conceptualize it the same way you do, which is why we have you here. But I always ask them, you know, what do you do? Who are you hoping to serve? And people say, well, I can work with anybody, you know, anywhere in Massachusetts and New Hampshire. Well, that's really hard for me to help you build any sort of marketing strategy. It's really hard for me to help you get referrals. I mean, I don't know how you go to a networking event and kind of stand out in any way, shape or form if you're just that much of a generalist. Kind of said it better. Perfectly articulated. It, and it's the fear. It just blows my mind, the people that are afraid uh, to niche you know, into a, a specific ideal customer, but it is so vitally important. And, and as real estate agents, uh, yeah, if somebody calls us on the phone and says, hey, I want to buy a house and it's, you know, within a reasonable amount of time from, you know, your office or house, of course, you're going to help them. All right. Or you're going to be smart enough to refer them to somebody else that can help them and make a referral fee on it. There's money there if it's a mm -hmm. phone call. But when we're talking about marketing ourselves and getting our presence out there like real estate agents need to do, must do, if you're going to excel, mm -hmm. you know, where you're going to spend your money and how you're going to get the return on your investment has everything to do with who you're targeting. And that niche is so important to figure out that ideal customer and talk directly to that ideal customer and spend those dollars directly to that ideal customer. Customer. If you don't do that, Tanya used to call it spray and pray marketing, which I was mm -hmm. guilty of for 20 years before I met her. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I asked this uh, this billionaire one time that I worked with. He actually was a principal in the auction company I worked with. And I said, how much should a company my size be spending in marketing dollars? And his answer was all of it. <laughs> All of it. Like, what kind of answer is that? I even said, I'm like, what kind of answer is that? That doesn't tell me anything. And he never spoke again about it. Like, it was just, you know, and that's obviously not the truth. Uh, and I'm not a hedge fund kid like he was. Uh, so I can't spend all of it, right? I didn't 
come from that. I had to build it. And for 20 years, I thought, well, 50% of my marketing is going to work and 50% of my marketing is not going to work. We don't know which 50. So let's spend the hundred percent that we can and hope that the phone rings enough to pay for all of it. Mm-hmm. And Tanya changed all of that for me. She, she, we literally have and what we call the ecosystem and my staff now, after 10 years of doing this, we meet and talk about that graph. Uh, you know, is it Facebook? Is it billboards? Is it radio? Is it newspaper? Is it print ad? Is it mail outs? Is it referral? Is it community events? Where are our calls coming from? If you don't have your brand dialed in, you can't even start that wheel, that pie Mm -hmm. graph. You can't even start Mm -hmm. to think about that and then say, you know what? Uh, 25% of our budget went over here, but we only got 10% 10% of our calls from there. So we don't need to spend 25% in that area. We need to, and then look over here, we only spent 10% of our budget, but 30% of our phone calls came from there. Okay, well, we need to spend more money over here. And mm-hmm. if you are a single real estate agent, or if you're a broker with hundreds of agents underneath you, and you cannot articulate that, you have to spend time on your brand. Tanya, I, I know we have kind of a lot to get you and a lot of questions to ask, but I, I do want to kind of sit on this point for a little bit about, you know, identifying who you want to serve, because that's a really important question. I mean, it's not something that people can necessarily arbitrarily pick. How can somebody reflect and really articulate and hone in on who they want to serve? Okay. So you guys mentioned before we hit the live button that you wanted some good free advice today, right? (laughs) So, So we actually came up with a formula for that about a decade ago, and it's called the HEAP code. And H-E-A-P, it's an acronym. And so if you, I, I like to remember it this way. It brings you a heap of money. That's easy enough to remember, right? So um, I'd love to walk through the four areas of it with you guys and have everybody really super dialed in. It's very simplistic. It's not anything super scientific, but you'd be amazed how many people it helps to really dial in who that primary and secondary ideal customer is. So first of all, we'll start with the H. H is somebody you can help. And I know that sounds like, oh, well, that's a no-brainer. That's crazy. I can help right? anybody. Wow. I can help anybody, right? But it's actually somebody you can help because either you've been at that phase of life yourself, you have you work in a particular area or a on a particular specialty that serves that person very well. Who can you truly help the most? And when you really dial that in, that helps you begin to understand, okay, yes, I can help everyone, but these are the people I'm really suited to serve. And so that's the H. I should caveat this before mm-hmm. before we get started. So any of your listeners out there that maybe are starting out and you think, well, I don't have any customers to look back on to see right. about these questions that we're going to po- pose. Then just imagine the people from any other facet of your life. If you were a nurse before this or if you just out of high school, just imagine the people that you want to work in these four areas. OK, if you're somebody that's been in business for a while, look back on the clients that you've already had. Right. So the first person is help. Who can I help? Truly. The second one is who do I enjoy working with? Because this is really important because life is too short to dance with ugly personalities. And we all have had uh, those people who really we didn't enjoy working with. Maybe they were too belligerent. Maybe they they knew more than we did, whether they did or not. And and like if you don't want to work with those people, they're going to be time sucks. Uh, So you want to think about the people that I truly enjoy working with. Do I like millennials and that are the biggest? buying group right now in the real estate market. Uh, do I enjoy working with first time home buyers, move up people, downsizers like you, you know, real estate agents tend, as as, as you said uh, to in the beginning, Rory, they just tend to say like, oh, I'll help anybody anywhere. Are you going to buy Massachusetts? I'm licensed in the whole state, right? Well, that's true, but you don't live in the whole state. You live mm-hmm. in this area. You should be geo farming this area. Think about that. Uh, do you live in an area where there are a lot of Dell Webb, com- a big, huge Dell Webb community? or uh, retirement homes or that sort of thing. And so you're going to help people downsize out of this big old huge family home, empty nesters. Think about the people you enjoy working with. That's the E. All right. The A might sound like it's a little bit the same, but it's appreciate. Who appreciates what you have to offer? So you can enjoy working with somebody, but at the end of the day, if they end up calling their cousin, 
because they don't appreciate what you've brought to the table, then you're no better off. So appreciation is a huge thing. We want with appreciation comes referrals, right? If they appreciate what you've done for them, they'll recommend you to other people. If they just enjoy working with you, they might recommend you and they might not. So that A is very important. And mm -hmm. reviews, so huge. Mm -hmm. Like reviews are such a big, especially Google reviews. And we could talk about that if you guys want to. But mm -hmm. uh, yeah, appreciate are easy to get those reviews and easy to get those referrals. Very important. And keep those relationships with. And an appeal is profitable. It's, it's got to be profitable. If you say, hey, I like working with first time home buyers, but you live in areas where it's regentrification and there's not a lot of starter home pricing, well, you're in the wrong area for what you're trying to accomplish, right? If you say, I want to work with military people who are are coming out of the military and they want to buy, but you don't live near a base, uh, you know, unless you're going to make a referral-based business, you, you're you wasting your time. They're not profitable to you. You need to look around your area and say, what what is around this? Mm -hmm. Like the specific neighborhoods that we live in now where our corporate office is, the school is huge. It's the third best school in the entire state. People come here. It's a public school, but they come here wanting that school because of SAT scores and sports program. So we would be remiss if we said we wanted to work with military here. We're nowhere near a military base. Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. So it's got to yeah. be profitable. And profit's a great word, not a bad word. Well, it's a heap of great words right there you gave us. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you know, I think one thing that people get afraid of when they focus on a niche is picking the wrong niche. Maybe it's not big enough. Maybe they didn't do their homework enough. Maybe they just can't get traction in it because somebody else occupies that top spot in that niche. So what kind of advice would you give somebody that is not just starting out, but maybe just kind of picking a niche that feels like all the niches are already occupied? Like, how do you get a foothold in that niche? You put that flag in the ground and you own that flag. Yeah. Okay. And I, I'd like to say this, this actually happened to one of our agents out in California and she would receive uh, postcards in the mail from other realtors in this area where she wanted to do business. And she really wanted to get a foothold uh, and sell some of these million dollar homes in the area where she lived. In Costa and, was it, the actual right. neighborhood area in, around Carlsbad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And and so she would get the postcards from the other realtors and her husband would actually walk up and look at him and say, oh, my gosh, your postcard just looks terrible compared to this. You need some branding. Right. And so that's actually how she ended up coming to us. She heard about us on a podcast like this and she came to us. Well, when she did, we repositioned her and I that's the advice. Reposition yourself. If you want to go after something and you feel like there's at least enough abundance there that you can go after that and command that, then you need to reposition yourself as the person for that area. And, and that is done through an entire process. I, a lot of people think, uh, Hey, a branding is just about a logo, a photo and a tagline, but couldn't be farther from the truth. It's really an entire ecosystem. Like Michael said, we look at 77 different criteria when we brand somebody. So we put her through the program, rebranded her and instantly she started getting clients or started getting listings in her neighborhood. And today she is as happy as can be with her brand and also uh, runs a national referral network linking to many different agents in pretty much every state in the, in the U.S. now and does a phenomenal job with that. And her um, brand also helps with that as well. Mm -hmm. So, and, yeah. And it's also military based because uh, being in Carlsbad, you know, they're just north of Camp mm -hmm. Pendleton. So they have that area. She she did two different things that were pretty awesome. And it speaks to what you said, Jason. And I want to speak to that listener that's out there talk, that's thinking, oh, well, I live in an area, but so and so dominates that that mm -hmm. that is the very person you need to be going after. And I'll tell you exactly why. If you live in an area, you probably live in an area where somebody dominates. It's always that case. There's always the big alligator, right? But what you have to recognize is that is not a formidable foe. That is a foe that is so busy making money, they make mistakes. Mm -hmm. That is the very place that you should be showing up. Yes, you are going to be bludgeoned when you first step into that <laughs> arena. But if you are consistent to that arena, there are a lot of personalities that as instinctively, they will say, I'm not using that person because everybody else does. And then there's also those people that they that that huge presence fails 
because their systems are growing too. And they and they will get more business than they can actually handle, right? So if you follow along in, in those really deep set areas like that, they probably have a lot more reviews. But if you'll start looking, they probably have a lot more complaints. Don't be afraid. I want to talk to those people that are listening right now that are afraid. To, oh, we can't go into that area. So-and-so dominates that area. No, if you live there, that's where you should be going. Because I promise you there's opportunity there. That's a great piece of advice. I, I think, you know, we all kind of look at the big gorilla and say, whoa, how are we going to overcome that? But, you know, what do they say? The, the way to eat an elephant is one bite at a time, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 That's amazing advice. Uh, I have a feeling that I've already taken a couple things from this. Rory, what are you thinking would be a great way to, you know, introduce branding to, you know, a new agent? Like, you know, what, what are some things that you talk about with your agents? Well, how about this? I'll, I'll put myself out there and I'll talk about some of the things that I do and feel free to tell me where I'm going right and where I'm going wrong and coaching the new agents that come into to my office. Brand new agents come into the space and I ask them and explain to them that one of the core parts of their business is to have a niche and a specialty. And most of them look at me funny when I first mentioned that to them because they you know, they're new and they don't know how to answer the question or even come um, come up with it. So ask them to think about, you know, who are the people that already know, like, and trust you the most and kind of build something from there that's a, that's a theme. Now, of course, as new agents, if somebody approach them and wants to buy a house that's kind of outside that specialty, they'll do it. We all, most of us will take a look at that and really become the expert in that space. And again, a lot of the new agents look at me funny because they definitely don't feel like they're anywhere near becoming the expert on anything. But that's one of the, the core things I, I teach them to build um, a sustainable business, you know, and you can double down, you can do some online leads, you can do some online marketing, but all of that is kind of secondary to who you are and the brand you create for yourself. Now, what's dissatisfying to a lot of them is that it's a slow uh, it's a slow build branding yourself and coming up with a, a specialty doesn't necessarily uh, next month's rent is something that kind of builds and builds over time so i work with them on that thing but it kind of starts with asking the no, new agents you know who already knows likes and trusts you the most I and mean, can you build put something together coherent from there okay two things i'd love to address with that rory mm -hmm. first of all fantastic job because that is definitely headed in the right direction with them and I know that thinking about who already knows, likes, and trusts them can be super simple. Like we have one agent here in Michael's brokerage, as a matter of fact, who focuses on working with traveling nurses. Now, how did she get into that? Well, she actually followed up on a list that Michael gave her for investors in this area. One of the investors was a doctor. And since she helped him buy and sell a couple of homes, he has introduced her to every traveling nurse that works out of his hospital. And so that then became her niche because that's where she understood it's a different person in you know, different type of person their needs are a little bit different and so she really gravitated to that so think more outside the box of those things the other thing is um i'll never forget one time when a, a lady out of new orleans said to me um tanya i'm so glad that i built my brand with you guys because now I don't have any competition. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was very important. And I've, I've always um, repeated that as many chances as I get to repeat that, because what you're trying to do is differentiate yourself. And when you differentiate yourself, you don't have any competitors. So mm -hmm. I think that's one thing you could share with your guys as well, because it makes a huge difference that they understand that they're differentiating themselves. And when they do that, they don't they no longer fall into what we call the real estate sea of sameness right because there's so many out there whose brands are super similar they've got a photo they've got the logo on there they've got some tagline you or anyone you know like to buy or sell a home kind of stuff and that's what everybody has so the unique ones truly do stand out Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I want to add on, I want to pick tail on that. I'm, and I'm surprised actually that she didn't jump on this right off the bat. It, brands are not necessarily built on time. Uh, brands. I was going there. Time, time <laughs> helps yeah. brands. 
It does. It will help brands, so right? True. You, you, and it, like we look at it from a corporate structure. We have two different choices, right? If we, if we come from the street, and we're going to build these things up, then we need the time to be able to build this. If you're, if you're a Zillow, and you can go out here and and get everybody's life savings and then gamble it on iBuyer movements and things like that, you can spend twenty million dollars a year in advertising and build a Zillow mm-hmm. brand, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so you, you, it does work that way, but. The thing about personal branding is it does not, and this is Tanya's words, not mine. So I learned this from her, is it is built over impressions. So exposures the, or impressions, the yeah, minute not time. That you have decided this is who I am, and then you start looking for those people, every handshake, every card can build that brand. And we have had people that we started working with within a week of working with us, within two weeks of working with us, nailed that million dollar listing and had been in the business for 15 years and never had a million dollar listing mm-hmm. ever. Uh, you know, so so don't be afraid because you do hear it out there. You're like people be like, oh, it takes time to build a brand. Well, time is a benefit to a brand. It doesn't build a brand. What's going to build the brand is how many impressions and exposures you have to that ideal customer that needs what your service. And when you're the expert in that, like when you know more than anybody else, um, then it automatically just rises. You, The cream's going to rise to the top. People are going to recognize that. And so, you know, br- Brand is it's such this nebulous term. Um, you know, I, I work for more than two decades in the media and a lot of what we sold, I mean, I did digital media for the past decade and a half, but working for radio and TV companies, which are very big on brand building. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, when you're selling to local businesses, everyone wants to know that that dollar is going to be well spent. Um, so on the digital side, you can kind of track back where a lead came from, even though, you know, we'd always warn everybody like, hey, that might be the last click, you know, but what about all the brand building that went into, you know, the decision to make that click, right? You know, and I don't think everyone fully understood all that, um, you know, working in media that was very big on brand building and then also working in media that was very accountable. Uh, and it's a little bit of both. You, you need both those working together. You need to have you know some smarts to understand that you probably can't just do performance marketing and not have a brand element to it if you really want to optimize your marketing. Um, my question, uh, when people come to you for the first time, and I know that you guys run mastermind programs. In fact, when this is coming out, this is actually um, the end of August that this is coming out. I think your third mastermind is going to be launching around that time. If it I have will, that right after Labor Day. Perfect. Mm-hmm. So this is perfect timing. So if you're if you need help with brand building, you know, look in the show notes for all this and find your way over to uh, Brandface because they'll be starting the profitable brand mastermind coming up after Labor Day. Tell us what happens when someone reaches out to you for the first time. Like, are they do they have a brand? Do they need to get rebranded? Do they not even know where to start? What what's that handholding that kind of convinces them that this might be a good coaching program for them? Okay. So number one thing you want to look for is, are you making money? (laughs) Because if you're not, if you don't want to make money, don't call us because we (laughs) Mm -hmm. build profitable personal brands. So the main criteria for the real estate professionals that work with us, most of them have been in the business for a while, eight, 10, 12 years. And uh, most of them are making you know, decent money, but they know that there's a lot more out there that they could be doing. And they also know competition comes on fierce. So they realize, you know, they'll hear us on a podcast like this or something. And they'll realize, yeah, I'm leaving a lot of money on the table. And I think the hardest part is not even realizing where you're losing the money because you can't see it leaving your hands. So I'll give you a, for instance, If we look at the customer acquisition, it comes in three phases. Number one, you've got the introduction phase. They don't know you yet. You don't really know them. You've just been introduced. Maybe it's a lead, a a referral lead. You know, maybe it's a lead from a lead gen source, whatever that is. You're just now becoming aware of each other. Second phase is engagement. You're having an engaging conversation with that person about potentially doing business with them. Third is follow-up phase. Okay. For almost every single real estate agent out there, I don't worry about them in the engagement phase. Once you get in front of somebody, you get a chance to share what you're all about. Tell them how you can help them. They see your genuineness. They feel that. That's not a problem. Where most money is lost is on the front end and the back end. We don't even know how many opportunities are being lost because we have not differentiated ourselves from our other competitors, number one. Number two, on the back end, 
let's say you talk to 10 people this week. Well, there's probably only going to be two of those that are ready to move forward with you and sign on the dotted line today. The rest of them are like, oh, I'm just window shopping. I'm talking to two other agents, whatever that is. So the follow-up process is very important to continue to keep your brand out in front of that person to remind them of why you're the only choice for them until they make that decision. So we can't always see that money leaving our hands, right? So, Mm -hmm. but we need to be aware that there's a lot of money that's not even coming into your planet zone if you don't have your brand dialed in. If you're looking and feeling just like everybody else out there, you're losing money. There's no question about it. So most people realize by the time they get to us, yeah, I'm leaving money on the table. And so that's where the process starts. Some are completely like, hey, I'm a blank slate. I don't know how to do this. Others, we've had people in our program with double master's degrees in marketing that Mm -hmm. still hire us to do this and help them with their personal brand because like we say, it's hard to read the label when you're inside the jar. Love all these phrases that you have. This is great. How do you handle uh, people that might be a little more reserved or um, not as extroverted in their personalities? Because brand building, the way that we all kind of think about it is you know that rambunctious person maybe you see on TV or in every commercial that you hear on the radio or online. Mm-hmm. So how about that introvert? Like how can they benefit from your program? Uh, you know, that, that that's a fantastic question. And it is something that we uh, take very personal uh, because it, we want everybody to succeed the way we know they can succeed. Um, and we see limiting values, uh, limiting uh, thought processes in people's mind. And you're like, you know, no, you can do it. You, you can. It's there. Like just literally it's there. Like you're just doubting yourself for no reason. Uh, very hard to overcome. Very hard to overcome. But. What we have learned, um, because we didn't start this journey, I definitely didn't start this journey. I I learned from her and fell in love with it. And I was like, I want to be a part of this. And luckily, she asked me to be so. She says all the time, it was in her original book, that a great brand doesn't just change how people see you. It changes how you see yourself. And so we have had these awesome times and and I more than we can count. Very and emotional. Literally, actually. literally eight out of every 10 of our clients. We will read back their bios and we will read this information that we do the deep dive with from their personal guides and the counselors that they work with in our program. And 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 then we do that brand reveal because of it's so awesome. And they will cry and they'll be like, that I want to do business with that person. Or they'll be like, that's me. And we're we're always like, you just gave us the information like we just packaged it in a way you couldn't see because you know we're taught as human beings to be humble right we pretty much all of our parents sort of taught us that way don't be too i like she said at the beginning of this program i was that way i don't want to be seen as you know uh you know some arrogant guy that's just you know dominating this area i don't mind dominating the area but i want people to know that i really am approachable guy i'm fun i like to have, i'd rather have fun than work any day and <laughs> and so you know that but you you know you got to get that across to people but when they build that brand out they begin to see that and you see these aha moments i wish that we could pull every introvert that has been through our program out of their shell. But I can tell you that we have a massive amount of people that enter our program as an introvert and leave our program as an extrovert. Mm -hmm. Uh, Leslie, who actually was one of the ones that stands out to us that she quoted earlier when she said, you know what, it's finally gave me, a. I don't have to compete with anybody. Because she was in, a, in an office where she was like, you know, well, this is the the high producer. It's very this competitive. Producer. This is the how am I ever going to get to that spot? And then all of a sudden, when we gave her that niche and we gave and she had a whole lot of accolades, yeah. accolades on her side. She was a real estate. Her and her husband were real estate investors. Mm-hmm. She had been a real estate uh, agent for a decade or longer when she came in there. We, we just saw her flourish and continue to flourish after that. I wish we could say we do that with everybody. It is our intent to do that with everybody. Uh, because everybody is a star. It's just we don't humans don't believe it for some reason. I don't know why. I, I don't know why. But we're all put on this earth to do a specific thing. And if you're called to real estate specifically because of a experience in your life or because of a, a desire that you have for that, then you have you need to live up to that. It's your charge to live up to that. Um, but we do see a lot of change with that because a brand gives you something to live up to. And I mean, I completely understand that point there, just how deeply 
personal and emotional that can be because we're not just talking about a brand of some a company, you're actually going through the exercise of defining who you are and then how to tell people who you are. Um, and mm -hmm. if you've been operating one way for a long period of time, I mean, that's shifting somebody's deepest identity and their, their image their of paradigm. themselves. Yeah, yeah. yeah it, it truly is. I, I'll never forget this guy uh, hit me up through LinkedIn one day and he said, Tanya, can you make me a star? And, mm -hmm. and he was having fun, you know, and I thought that's great. And I said, Hey, uh, we don't make stars. We unveil them. And that stuck that stuck because it came from the heart. It's really what, what we do. There is, uh, I'll give this quote to Martha Van Weinsberg, who we had on our podcast yesterday. She said, no story is too small. Mm -hmm. And I loved that so much because that's what we've been saying just in different words. And, and no story, there is no story that's too small. Anything that makes you who you are today, somebody wants to know, somebody needs you, somebody needs your help. And that story that, that uh, molded and shaped you. That's the story people connect to. It's that human connection that is missing a lot of times in personal branding. Either what you notice in personal branding is either people tell way too much, right? <laughs> we don't mm -hmm. advocate for that, <laughs> or they or they are so reserved they don't share anything about themselves. So it doesn't mean you have to share the dirtiest details of your life, but uh, opening up just a little bit and letting people know why you are doing what you're doing is a huge thing. Yeah, the why is big. Yeah. yeah. I've been going through a lot of that since I left my job last year. Um, and, you know, now I'm a full time real estate investor, right? We run our short term rentals. And, you know, Rory and I have talked a lot about this. And I've wanted to make sure that I kind of totally rebrand myself in the minds of the people that know me. They've known me as a media person for a long time, or they had no idea what I did. You know, you had mentioned earlier, our parents don't know what we do for our jobs. I think they thought that I was a DJ for 25 <laughs> years, which is right? nothing wrong with doing that. But, you know, I was on the other side of the radio, uh, the radio building or TV building. But yeah, you know, I've, I've been rebranding, you know, I've been trying to, you know, tell the story of, hey, there is life after your W2 job, if you set yourself up well with, you know, investments that are cash flowing and how to grow that and how not to have fear and how to find uh, a new niche of people and how to just to keep pushing forward and not even care about, you know, what the past was. And I've had people reaching out to me from different walks of my life that I wouldn't have expected to have heard from that ask like questions about this, whether it's a tactical question about short-term rentals or whether it's like a big, broad question of, man, like, how are you doing this? Like, how did this come about? Like, how do you have the confidence to do it? Or I want to be in this position. You know, so I think my rebranding is happening, right? You know, and and I don't really know what the answer is. Like, meaning I don't have a goal. Like, I'm not a real estate agent. You know, Rory is the one that right. deals with the real estate, you know, professionals. But, you know, my only goal was to, you know, recast who people see me as when I walk into a room. And I think that's actually working. Um but I'm sure if I went through your program, uh, I could even, uh, you know, 10x that somehow. I we did... need to talk about that, Jason. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, maybe I'll be in that September class. Rory, any final thoughts before we get to the final questions that we have for Tanya and Michael? I just want to um to to ground some of this a little bit because you talked about some pretty high level um really important things and I just want to give our listeners a taste of some of the nitty gritty um what are some of just the pure on the ground tactics that go into making a good brand. Okay, so so first of all, it all begins with answering those five questions we talked about a little bit mm -hmm. earlier. And I'll send these to you guys too if you want and post them in the comments. But those are where that's where everything begins, is really digging down deep into that. The second thing I would say is be very forward about being yourself, right? And I know that sounds very ethereal, and it is very ethereal because um that that's just the way personal branding is perceived by the world but what we do in our program is we have formulas not fluff right so even though we can talk a lot about this the heap code is one of our formulas we also have a stair method and the stair method actually takes somebody through all of the steps of how to determine what their points of differentiation are and which one rises to the top so those are things that i know we don't have time to go through here today but i'll be glad to answer you know any questions for anybody if you hit us up in the comments later i'll, I'll be happy to do that but those are the things that are really important. Don't leave it to just the ethereal thought process. There are actual steps that that you'll go through. 
And I'd like to pigtail on that as a broker and a real estate agent since 1994, an agent since 94, broker since 2000. You know, I would like to take over the world. I'd like to have a brokerage in every city and every state, right? You know, like we'd all like to be Keller, Gary Keller, right? It'd be awesome, right? But it's, but start, don't be afraid to get into a neighborhood and just know that neighborhood. Uh, if, and, and I hope that that listener right. out there can take that and really make, set their flag in the ground and start working. If you know everything about a certain neighborhood, a geo farming area, don't take on too big of a space. Don't take on more than you can handle. If you can't be in that neighborhood once a week, if you can't know every house that is sold and why it's sold for what it's sold for and be that authority, then shrink it to where you can. And that what that is and use your brand in those five questions in every one of those scenarios and just keep thinking of way, another way, another way, another way, another way, another way that I can get that brand to that area, you will see your business explode. Yeah. And if someone already dominates, which they probably do, who cares? Just go for it. They, They're absolutely. going to be the only one that cares. That that dominating person is going to be the only one that cares, and mm-hmm. they already don't care about you. So it doesn't matter. <laughs> <laughs> you haven't that, lost anything. <laughs> that, 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 yeah, no, it's great advice. And I mean, self-limiting beliefs, I think, are something that are just tough for people to overcome. And if someone's going to go cool. into a niche or a neighborhood saying, well, man, you know, this company already dominates, so, you know, who am I to really plant a flag and go after it. That's a self-limiting belief, right? Yeah. That's you saying yeah. that that you, you can't do it before you even try. Exactly. Do it differently is exactly. what I yeah. say. Don't yeah. don't go in pretending to be the number one person or even gunning for the number one person necessarily. Go in differently. Yeah, just mm-hmm. find some way that you that separates you from any other competition in there and I guarantee you you will find your people. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, we could talk for hours and we could talk about we didn't even talk about the orange on your back. And we just, we had a conversation before we hit the ca- uh, <laughs> record know. about my orange car and our orange pens here and your orange background. We all love the color orange. So orange me- coffee cup. Yep. <laughs> I saw, I saw that Rory's got orange behind him. People who know us personally know the orange is a big part of our lives too. So maybe, maybe we're connected on, on that level guys, but let's uh, ask the questions that we ask all of our guests just to wrap up the interview. Uh, these are three easy questions that, you know, we both can answer or one, or you could alternate. It's your choice. Uh, and then after these, we will, uh, um, you know, find out where people could reach out to you and we'll link everything up in the show notes, obviously. First of these final questions, if you can get on stage for half an hour and talk about any subject in the world with zero preparation, what would that be? Oh gosh, for me, it would be differentiation. I mean, that's an easy one for me. It's a low hanging fruit, right? But mm-hmm. it is what I truly believe in. And, um, and I think that is what gives us the power to uh, be ourselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And uh, I guess mine would be, uh, you know, being bolder about what you do. Like, I, I think that um, I, I think limiting beliefs is something that I battle with every day uh, and have battled with since I was a kid. And I think I'm not different than the other eight billion people on Earth. And I would talk about how we all need to get over that. Yeah. Yeah. I hear that that comes up so often on this podcast. Also, um, it's a common running theme. And, you know, I'm, I'm glad that there are people like you out there to help us overcome that. Secondly, tell us something that happened early in your lives or careers that impacts the way that you're working today. Okay, for mine, it would be probably a real personal story and one that really didn't resonate with me too much until a couple of years ago. I was raised in a small town in North Georgia, Dawsonville, that's the name of the town. It's the moonshine capital of the world. My grandfather was a moonshiner. My Home grandmother stock. was a Home moonshiner. Stock car racing. Yeah, uh, most of his brothers and brothers were moonshiners, and uh, that's cool. It's a cool factor, and I love it. It's a part of my history. But with it also comes a little bit of you know um, negatives, right? Mm-hmm. You have a lot of alcoholism and a lot of addiction in your family and in the town that you live in. And so, in my family, it was I was surrounded by it all over the place. And I remember being a young kid and thinking, why do people make that decision over and over again? And they're getting the same results, right? And I don't know. God just granted me with a little bit of wisdom as a young person, I think. And I just always wonder why people make the choices that they make. And then it dawned on me just a a few years ago, they make those decisions because sometimes the only difference between a young person waiting for the next drug deal and a young person headed off to college with a bright future is self-worth. 
And it just comes down to that for me. And I don't care if you're the most confident person in the world and run a you know, nine-figure business or whether you're somebody that's you know struggling in life. There's something that you're dealing with that causes self-worth issues from time to time. And I think knowing who you are and what makes you different from everybody else in the world is that first big step toward accepting yourself and seeing your own self-worth. And so that, for me, that was it. Yeah. Uh, mine, awesome. my dad stole my life savings when I was 16 years old. Yeah. 4,600 bucks. I saved, I'd worked all my life to get up to that, to buy my car and my dad ran off with it. Um, I don't hate my dad for that. Um, I just started over and I've started over every time that anything like that's ever happened. And I can say right now, I lived a life that I'd enjoy and do every day what I want to do. And I love it. And uh, I've just always been blessed by just putting my head back down and going back to work. Yeah. Uh, amazing life lessons uh, shows a resiliency also for both of you in both those situations. So thank you for sharing those. Sure. Uh, yeah. Final question we have, tell us something that you're listening to or watching or reading these days, anything in the world. Okay. Well, I mm -hmm. think we can both probably answer this, mm -hmm. this question, Traction, a book mm -hmm. uh, called, Tra what, who's the author? Oh, please. Uh, I can't remember his name right now, but it's tr Traction. Yeah. It's on my uh, Audible right now. Thank okay. You. Um, <laughs> right there. Right Thank there. goodness. There's there yes. you go. <laughs> that Gino, you know, Wickman. Wick, okay. Wickman. I knew, yes. Wickman. I knew Adam yes. at the end of it. Yes. Okay. So I still, I have maybe two hours of that book left and uh, it's on Audible for me as well. And mm -hmm. I think it's just a phenomenal book to get you to see the structure of your business a little differently and also to think out of the box when it comes to sales um, and how to treat your team members and your customers. Mm -hmm. I, I love it. I can't say enough good things about it so far. I, I would agree yeah. 100%. Yeah, that's, yep. a, that's one we're stuck on right now. And we love it. I'm with you. I had it on yesterday in the car. That's awesome. <laughs> um, so, connection, Jason. Yeah, exactly. It certainly is. Um, <laughs> So, uh, so as we mentioned earlier, uh, you guys have a mastermind coming up, the Profitable Brand Mastermind, which is starting some um, after Labor Day. If you're listening to this episode right when it comes out, um, you're just in time. If not, there'll probably be another one in the future. But uh, talk about how people can reach out to both of you and learn more about you know what you're doing at Brandface and all your coaching programs. Okay, so uh, brandfacestar.com, S-T-A-R. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where you can find out anything you want to know, including um, testimonials from our clients, those kind of things that are really important for people to know. Uh, but so, but if you're somebody that's sitting there right now and you're thinking, okay, I know that I really need help with this and you want to talk to us about it, you can cut straight to the front of the line by going to discussyourbrand.com and it allows you to just book something right now. Mm -hmm. So, um, so those two things, brandfacestar.com and discussyourbrand.com. All right. Links in the show notes, they will be there. Just go down below, click on that, and you'll find your way to both those websites very easily. Um, as you will, if you want to go visit Rory's website, Rory, uh, you, where can people find you? You can find me through my real estate brokerage. That's Next Home Title Town, nexthometitletown.com, or through my law practice, Urban Village Legal. That's at urbanvillagelegal.com. Awesome. Tanya and Michael, this has been um, a delightful conversation. I've learned so much about, you know, personal branding and knowing your self-worth and overcoming obstacles. And, you know, I have no doubt in the world your coaching program would really just, you know, open up lots of, um, you know, new pathways in my head. And I'm sure it does that for a lot of your students. So thank you so much for sharing uh, some of your insights here on this podcast. Thank you. For thank you us. guys. And thank you for listening. If you've enjoyed this episode, we'd appreciate it if you could subscribe to the podcast or drop us a comment. Uh, you could reach me directly if you want to reach out to Jason at nexthometitletown.com. We read all your comments, we respond to all your messages, and we pass along any messages to people like Tanya and Michael if you want to reach out to them through us. Um, so on behalf of everyone here, thank you so much for listening, and we will see you next time. This has been the Real Estate Law Podcast. Because real estate is more than just pretty pictures, and law goes well beyond the paperwork and courtroom arguments. We're powered by Next Home Title Town, Greater Boston's progressive real estate brokerage. More at nexthometitletown.com. And Urban Village Legal, Massachusetts Real Estate Council, serving savvy property owners, lenders, and investors. More at urbanvillagelegal.com. 
Today's conversation was not legal advice, but we hope you found it entertaining and informative. Discover more at realestatelawpodcast.com. Thank you for listening.